how y'all doing? Nall back here again, and hopefully at this point you've you've maybe written a few small, simple little Go programs. Maybe not even one dissimilar from the one that I have right here. Um, and usually at some point after you've written some code, especially if you're you know newer with a language, you may go back to your code and go, hmm, I think I could do this better. Um, what this essentially is called is a, this is a term used called refactoring, which is like you want to go back to your code and change it for some reason. <laughs> Maybe you want to um, uh, just change how you did it just for the shits and giggles. Maybe you know of a more efficient way to implement the same functionality, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so I'm, maybe I'm going to do that right here, um, but I'm going to intentionally introduce a a boo boo. So I'm going <laughs> to look at my square function here, which as you can tell, just takes a number and just squares it. Um, and maybe I think, well, maybe I can do this a different way, but I'm going to intentionally do it wrong. Like, okay, I'm just adding the numbers. So I'm going to go down here and do go run. And I'm like, well, that's not right. Four square is not 16. Um, so what do we do about this? <clears throat> what we have done is we have introduced what's called a regression, which is a fancy word for saying you broke shit that already worked. Um, and something that is a common, commonly good practice to do before you start changing code that already worked is, uh, let me change this back for you, um, is you start writing tests for your code. Uh, tests ensure that if you have code that presumably already works and you want to go back and change it, you, um, even after you change it, it still does what it's supposed to do. And, um, in Go, this is actually extremely easy to do because unlike a lot of other languages where you have to rely on like third party, like testing frameworks to use it. Like if you're from Ruby, you're probably familiar with RSpec. If you're from Java, you're probably familiar with something like JUnit. But Go actually has a testing package built into the standard library. So we're gonna write a test for this square function, okay? So I'm gonna open up a, I'm gonna open up a new file and I'm gonna explicitly call it main underscore test dot go. Um, the name is actually important. By default, when you run the go test um, command from your, your command line or whatever you're using, um, it will specifically look for every file in your project that has that, that like name pattern of underscore test.go and it will run those tests. <clears throat> you can explicitly tell it to only run certain tests or only to run tests in certain packages, but for the sake of this, we're just going to be running this. Um, now there's a, um, a fairly norm, a fairly kind of standardized uh, way of um, writing your tests in Go. So we are going to be testing that square function. So the standard way to do this is, so for each test, it's going to be a function. Um, oh, right. And you're going to be importing, uh, I'm, I'm going to import this manually, even though my plugins will just import it anyway. Uh, you're going to import this package called testing is what you're going to be importing. Um, so for every test that you want to write, for every like function that you want to, you want to test, you're going to have a function here, and it's typically it's called test, and then the name of the function you're testing. So in this case, we're testing square, and it takes an argument. And the only argument it needs is um, typically you call it T, and it's a pointer to this. Um, actually, I forget exactly what this is, but I guess it's basically like a struct or something in this testing package called T. Uh, that's all you have to do to basically tell. Go that this is a this is a test that you want to run on your code, and we're going to start off extremely simple. Uh, so let's say we're going to say the, the thing the, the the great thing about the the standard testing library in Go is you're you're literally just writing like normal Go code. It's just your normal Go code is testing other Go code. That's essentially what's happening. Uh, I'm going to say a uh, result of square equal of four. So Presumably this gives us 16. And I'm gonna write it, um, if result does not equal 16, um, we're gonna to call a function in the, um, from this uh, like test test unit, I don't know what I'm gonna call this test unit thing that we have passed in there called um, ARF. Um, I'm all, I use ARF because I like, like giving more information about like what was wrong. <laughs> and I'm gonna say, 
square returned a uh, wrong value percent d uh, expected percent d and it returned result and I expected 16. So we have a, this 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 is a test now this this will run. So I changed this back. So if I run go test right now, you'll see pass. Um, if you want to see more information about, <clears throat> say, like what tests are running or how long they took, you can pass the dash V uh, flag in here for verbose, and you'll see it says like what tests it ran and how long it took. Uh, but now let's go back to um, let's go back to that other file and let me break this on purpose again to uh, <coughs> simulate me refactoring this and screwing it up. Now if I run this test again, oops, the test failed. You see, it says square returned wrong value eight expected 16. Pretty straightforward. So we have caught that whatever change it, that you made to your code was, it broke your, it, your, your function is now not behaving the way that it was meant to be. So I'm gonna <coughs> change this back. Now, um, usually you don't wanna just test for one thing. You wanna have some like multiple test cases. And your first reaction may be to just just keep doing something like resolve equals square, you know, and you just start throwing different numbers at it. And <clears throat> if your tests are really small, you can certainly do this. But there's a much more, uh, uh, there's a, a much better way to do this that is uh, uh, called uh, table-driven testing, I believe is what it's called. Um, so I'm going to show you that approach for having like multiple test cases, okay? So we're, I'm gonna get rid of all this. <clears throat> and what I typically do when I do this is at the very start of the function, I create a variable, usually call something like test cases. And it is going to be a slice of an anonymous struct. Um, it's an anonymous struct because uh, depending on what test you're running, your test cases maybe have different shape. Uh, the very basic format these tend to have, at least when I write them is, they have a description of a, that's a string, an input, which in this case will be an int because square takes an int as an input. And then the expected is an int. So let's put that first test case we have back in here. We're gonna have, uh, <coughs> let's see, um, correctly squares a number. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. And it takes in four and it should return 16. Uh, so now we have our first test case. And what I usually do when I do this is so we're going to um we're going to do the range keyword over this slice. So for um I don't care about the index, so for whatever and test case equals range over the test cases. We're going to use this other function on this little test case uh, variable we have called run, which will have it essentially execute like a, a like a subtest under this main test. Um, and the first argument will be the like description of this this particular like subtest. And in this case, it's going to be test case dot description. And then the second argument is a is a function that has basically the same signature as the function you're in. What most people tend to do and what I do is you just pass in an anonymous function that looks very, as I said, the same as the other functions in here. So it'll be t uh, pointer to test t. And we're going to say, um, I'm also going to use uh, what's kind of like a special syntax of an if statement in Go called a, I think it's called like a an if initialization statement. So basically what it is, is you can have an if statement uh, be kind of a, a, co a combination of both an if statement and a, a variable initialization or assignment. So I'm going to say if result equals a square of test.input, then you put a semicolon, if result does not equal test case dot expected, we are going to do uh, that t dot error f. Oops, error f. <laughs> and I'm going to say um, what I'm going to say in incorrect uh, value 
got percent D expected percent D. Uh, let's see, got expected. So test case dot input test case dot expected. Should be right. Okay. So this should be fine now. I think. I think. So it is complaining at me for some reason. Let's see if I didn't make a boo boo. Um, undefined test. What did I do? Oh, whoops! I see what I did. <laughs> it's the uh, it's test case, Donnie, not test. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So let's run this now, and this should work because I changed the function back to the way it's supposed to be. Okay. Um. So let's um let's throw some more test cases in this thing now, shall we? Um, let's say, um, correctly squares another number, uh, three, and it should be nine, right? So now if I run this now, you'll see it ran two tests, two, or I guess I used to say two subtests here. It says correctly squares a number, yay. Correctly squares another number, yay, that worked too. Uh, maybe be a little more different, like, uh, Correctly squares a negative number, number, and I'm gonna say negative two should be four. I'm gonna say this and run this, and that one works too. So now you can quickly add new test cases to this test instead of having to like write a bunch more code just to implement a new test case, all you gotta do is just add an entry into the slice and ta-da, you have a new test case. Um, uh, you also, you don't have to do this whole thing where you're starting up like a, a subtest. Oh, I'll figure out, I don't know what the actual term for these things are called. Uh, and I actually used to not do this, but this looks much better in uh, the output to tell you exactly what's happening than if you just, like, just did this by itself. Uh, so <laughs> something else you can do with Go's testing package right out the get go is uh, you can actually check for um, coverage and actually generate like a coverage report of, of how much of your code is actually being covered by your tests. And uh, let me look this, I got to reference something. I had this written down somewhere. So uh, where is it? Okay, yeah. So we're going to do Go test. I'm still going to do dash V just so I like to see it. But you see, actually, you see the the my history here. You pass this cover uh, keyword in to get test coverage, and I believe if you don't pass in cover profile, you will just get the coverage report in the console. Maybe I think yeah, coverage fifty percent of statements. So there half of my code base in that main dot go function and that main and that main dot go file is being covered by tests. Um. If you include in this cover profile, um, this will write out the report to a file. And what you can do with that is there's um, uh, a little uh, tool you can use called cover, which will generate a HTML page that you can look at. So we're gonna do HTML equals the file that I created. And the output is coverage.html. And let me open that up for you one second. Let's see, brave coverage. Break this out into its own thing. Go over here. And you will see that we have generated a coverage report. And the code in red is not being covered, and the code in green is covered. So it's not pretty, but again, this is just baked into the standard package library of Go. Uh, which is pretty nice, I think, without having to rely on third party you know dependencies and stuff. And there you go. Now you should be able to write tests for your Go code to make sure that when you change it, either because you know you just want to change it up or because you think you have a better way of doing it, you won't accidentally break the shit. Um, if you like the video, be sure to share it with someone else in case you think it would be help them. Um, if you have any questions um, or would like to join the ever so slowly growing community that I'm trying to build, uh, there should be a link to my Discord server in the description. Um, and with that, uh, be sure also be sure to wear whatever platform you're on, whatever the vernacular is they use, 
Uh, be sure to subscribe or follow to find out when I upload more videos like these, and there will be more. With that, y'all come on back now, and I'll see you next time.